Hey guys, um, I thought I'd come outside to the playground. Mm, look how quiet it is out here. Um, I thought I'd come out here, it's so nice out today, and read chapters 22 and chapters 23 in Insignificant Events in the Life of a Cactus by Dusty Bolin. Chapter 22, Connor and I walked up to the door of the Tourette's support group. Here we go again, he said under his breath as I opened the door. This month's group was smaller. Only Dexter, Jack, and Mason were there. Hey, armless Avon, Dexter said. Is that a new tick, Dexter? I asked, thinking of his tendency to say inappropriate things. What do you mean, he said, a baffled expression on his face. I grinned at the floor. Never mind. Dexter patted the seat next to him. Come sit over here, chicken nibble. Connor and I sat in two seats next to Dexter. Where's everyone? I asked. I don't know, Dexter said. Maybe Rebecca slapped herself so hard, chicken nipple, that she's lying passed out on her kitchen floor. Jack snorted loudly. <laughs> That's not cool, Dex, he said. I shook my head. Definitely not cool. I'm sorry, he said, clearing, clearly doing his best to look innocent. It could be the bathroom floor. That's enough, Dexter. Andrea looked up from the clipboard she held on her lap. That's almost crossing the line into making fun of instead of making fun with. She stared him down, but I could hear some playfulness in her voice. I'm sorry. Dexter hung his head and stuck out his lip. I won't do it again. He covered his mouth to hide his obvious grin. Well, it looks like this is all we have today, Andrea said. Why don't we go ahead and get started? Since we all talked a little bit last month about our fear of going out in public, I thought this month would be a good time to talk about some techniques for staying relaxed when we go out. There's no reason any of you should feel you need to stay confined to your house out of fear of venturing out. It's so important you all live your lives as normally as possible, and feeling comfortable when you go out in public is a big part of that. But what if we can't relax and our ticks get really bad? Jack said, letting out a loud whooping noise. Don't already decide that you can't relax in public, Jack, Andrea said. That's why I'm going to teach you some techniques you can use. Are you going to tick in public? Probably yes. You have to accept that, but you don't have to allow it to get out of control. Is this going to be about habit reversal training? Connor asked, because I've already tried that. What's that? I asked him. Before he could answer me, Andrea said, No, Connor, we're not going to be discussing habit reversal training today. Connor turned to me. It's when you try to focus your attention on doing something that's basically like competes with the tick as soon as you feel the urge. Over time, it's supposed to help you feel the urge to tick less. Does it work? I asked. A little, Connor said, but I hadn't been very good about doing it. It can work well for many kids, Andrea said, but today we're just gonna focus on relaxing. I ignored her. Maybe you should try it again if it helped, I said to Connor. I told you I'm not going to therapy anymore, Avon, he said. Besides, it didn't work well for me. I frowned and kicked my chair legs as Andrea went on about how to breathe deeply. We all closed our eyes and she told us to breathe in slowly through our noses and out slowly through our mouths. I found it difficult to relax with Dexter repeatedly saying chip chicken nipple next to me, but I did my best. Now, Andrea said in a soothing voice, feel a warmth in your chest, a wonderful warmth that travels from your chest to your shoulders, now down your arms and into your fingertips. I couldn't help it. I totally burst out laughing. Then Connor and the other guys joined me. You feel that warmth in your fingertips, Avon? Dexter asked. Andrew, Andrea tried to continue talking about the warmth drifting down to our legs and feet, but everyone kept giggling and ticking. So eventually she gave up and talked to us about other ways we could relax in public. These included using our breathing, visualization, medication, and even counting or going over times tables. At some point, Andrea said, we should all have a goal we were working toward. It didn't need to be big, 
but something easily attainable. Like my parents had always taught me, one small goal at a time. Dexter said he wanted to get through a meeting without calling his mom to check the stove. Andrea said that was a good goal. Then Dexter asked if I could go call his mom to check the stove. Jack said he had wanted to talk to this girl at school he liked. Not ask her out or anything, but just say hi. And Mason wanted to stop making farting noises. When Andrea asked me what my goal was, Connor and I looked at each other with knowing grins. But I wasn't about to tell the whole group about our murder investigation. Instead, I said I wanted to learn how to use nunchucks, which was also true. When Andrea asked Connor about his goal, I blurted, Connor's going to challenge the next person who makes fun of him at school to a cage match. The others giggled, but Connor squinted at me suspiciously and then turned his attention to Andrea. I guess I should try to get out somewhere, he said. I haven't been out anywhere but school and stagecoach pass since I moved. The way he said his goal felt noncommittal, and I doubted that he would follow through with it. Andrea gave us the last 10 minutes to socialize, so everyone wanted me to show them what kinds of things I could do with my feet. Andrea handed me her clipboard, paper, and pen, and I wrote, people with arms are lame. I also opened up a water bottle with my hair in a ponytail. Impressive st I also opened up a water bottle and put my hair in a ponytail. Impressive stuff. Wow, Avon, Dexter said, you're like a superhero like a totally awesome armless superhero. If only I had those nunchucks, I said. Armless Avon, Dexter announced, able to open water bottles with a single toe. I blushed, that darn idiopathic craniofacial arrhythmia. Not a single toe, but that's okay, I glanced at Connor, but he wasn't smiling. Actually, he looked downright annoyed. Later on the way home, I asked him, what's the matter with you? Nothing. He slumped down in his seat and crossed his arm. Dexter just thinks he's so funny. He is funny, I said. I can tell you think he's so funny, but I don't. He turned away from me so he could stare at the window. He's starting to get on my nerves calling you armless Avon, he mumbled. Someone at the support group calls you Armless Avon? Is that from his Tourette's? Mom said. No, Connor said. It's from his stinky personality. I looked at Mom in the rearview mirror. I could tell from her wrinkled, squinty eyes that she was grinning. I grinned back and then looked out my own window, hardly able to keep myself from giggling. I had never, ever in my entire life made a boy jealous until now. Chapter 23. Christmas at Stagecoach Pass was actually pretty cool. My parents decided it was worth it to hire a company to come in and decorate the park with lights and a big tree in the middle of Main Street. We pulled all the old Christmas decorations out of storage and placed them around the park. Things like wreaths made of horseshoes and cowboy boots filled with fake poinsettias. Dad made sure the company he hired strung lights over the covered wagon that marked the entrance. They also added the word Christmas after Stagecoach Pass, so everyone would know something a little different was going on. I had the idea to set up a booth that sold hot cocoa and s'mores fixings, and we lit fires in a couple of the old metal garbage cans. I'd never expected the Arizona nights to get so cold. The weather even, even dipped below freezing a couple of times. I actually got to wear my earmuffs while I stood outside with Connor roasting marshmallows over the fire. Well, he roasted marshmallows for me. I didn't exactly need my toes freezing off. It's too bad Zion's gone for winter break, I said. Zion and his family were spending two weeks in New Zealand. They'd gone all the way to the other side of the world to visit the movie sets from the Lord of the Rings. My dad had raised an eyebrow when I told him that and said, I've got to meet these people. Zion told me it's actually summer down there right now. I said, how weird is that? Connor didn't answer as he looked around and barked nervously. The roasting sticks he held over the fire shook a little. This place is busier than ever, he said and barked. The people roasting marshmallows across from us stared at him. Don't let it scare you off, 
I said. Connor looked offended. I won't. I mean, you know, as long as it doesn't get too busy. I raised an eyebrow at him. What qualifies as too busy? Connor shrugged. Busier than this. Well, I hope that's not true because I would miss you. I'm sure it will be dead against when Christmas is over, Connor said, which was obviously reassuring to him, but not to me. I didn't want the park to get dead again. Connor pulled a marshmallow off the stick and shoved it into my mouth. Then things can just go back to normal. I don't want to go normal, I said, my mouth stuffed full of marshmallow. Huh? I swallowed. I don't want it to go back to normal. I want it to stay busy. You realize if the park closes down, my parents lose their jobs, and we probably have to move again. Connor frowned. Yeah, I didn't think of that. He stuffed another marshmallow into my mouth. Then, I hope it stays busy, just as long as it doesn't get too busy. We invited Connor and his mom over for Christmas Eve. We held a dinner in the steakhouse and invited all the employees who didn't have any family to spend with. Mom and Dad ordered three big turkeys. What can I do to help? I asked Josephine, who was ordering everyone around in the kitchen. They were busy making cornbread stuffing, mashed potatoes, corn, and of course, cowboy beans, cornbread, and coleslaw, which I would most definitely not be eating. Coleslaw was ruined for me for life and would forevermore be known as pit slaw. Josephine handed me a masher. Why don't you just mash them potatoes? She stuck the giant pot of potatoes on the floor for me, and I worked on handling the masher with my feet. Several of the employees stopped to watch, but Josephine told them all to skedaddle. Those will be the best mashed potatoes you ever put in your mouth, she snapped at anyone who raised an eyebrow at me mashing the potatoes. At one point, Henry walked in, he put his hands on his hips. Avon Kavanaugh, he scolded. What are you doing with your feet in the food? I didn't think Josephine could have looked more shocked than if a tarantula the size of a horse had trampled through the room. You crazy old kook, she said to Henry. Don't you know her name by now? Get out of here and make yourself useful. She shooed him out of the room and neither one of them returned. When I was done with the potatoes, I peeked my head through the swinging doors of the kitchen. I watched Connor and his mom sitting at a table together with my mom, talking and laughing. I knew this was the first time they'd eaten in a restaurant together since Connor's ticks had started, so I was glad to see Connor look so comfortable, although he didn't eat very much during dinner. As we all sat together at the table, I whispered to Connor, Henry just called me Avon Cavanaugh in the kitchen. He scrunched up his nose. Like you said, he gets really confused. I picked up my fork with my toes and stabbed a big bite of turkey. I guess he does keep confusing me for someone else, but why would he think I was a Cavanaugh? Honor shrugged. Maybe you look like a Cavanaugh. I shoved the bite of turkey in my mouth and chewed as I thought about this. If only we could find that missing picture from the museum, I said. Maybe that would tell us something. We'll just have to keep searching the storage shed. There's got to be something in all that junk. As I nodded, I stabbed another chunk of turkey. I hope so. That evening, Mom and Dad gave me my Christmas present a pair of turquoise and silver earrings they had purchased from a Navajo woman. I thought if I ever got that necklace cleaned up and maybe got a new chain for it, it would look nice with my new earrings. I also thought this Navajo woman could, should come sell her jewelry at Stagecoach Pass. Actually, I couldn't stop thinking of things that we should do with the park. I had a lot of ideas. Later that night, I dragged Dad out onto the tarantula hunting. I'd done this several times before. I'd become obsessed with finding a live tarantula. He held the flashlight for me so I could sneak up on any holes I had found earlier in the day, thinking they might be tarantula burrows. I never did find one. No matter how much I searched, I began to wonder if I ever would.